Terrific playing. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, obviously, you know this piece really well, and you have a, a, a wonderful sense of it. I have a couple of sort of thoughts about it to share with you and just questions for you. Um, so, if you were to sort of describe, describe this, the movement, just kind of in, in its general character, how would you, how would you sort of, what, what kinds of things would you? Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're proud. Mm-hmm. Um, Is it joyful? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, and, and he's, and, but it's not always joyful, obviously, there's dark, very dark sides, as Brahms always has, um, you know, sort of alternating these things. Um, what about the end, is the end, what, what about the end, is the end triumphant, joyful, I mean, you can be triumphant and joyful, I guess, but, um, <laughs> it's not serioso, right? Right. At the end. Yeah, so, just, just finding, I mean, I think it's really important to define different places in the piece with very specific types of attitude and color because I found sometimes in the piece that, that um, you play you know, with real strength and sometimes I really felt that the color and the energy that you were giving me matched the character of the music and the harmony but sometimes it felt it was more like you were feeling and it's easy I know very easy in this piece to feel oh I have to play big and intense all the time and, and to find ways of actually sounding bright as you say and, and triumphant and not in you know this you know so so open like F major I mean even though on the cello it, it is a quite an open key even though F's are difficult on the cello let's face it but but you know you, you try to think of the openness of, of, of the key and I felt particularly sort of the last the, the, just the last few bars that that was a case that you could be more there's the, you know the clouds have, have gone away that, that it's sort of more more open in a way, yeah? So, um, like, can you actually just start with it? Just the very last vivace, just right at the end there, the forte, the last forte. And by the way, it's forte, not fortissimo, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, you know, she's playing with you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so, and you guys are absolutely rhythmically in sync, yeah? And you're very much into your own world, right? Okay. So see if you can use her chords. Um, and Dina, play them for us. Do bom, bom. Yeah. For all, just like. Yeah. So you can can you like figure out, feel, find a way of, of making her sound part of that harmony? Okay. So yeah. Once more, same. <laughs> better already better so kind of get just get out, get your listening a little bit more to the to the collective sound of, of both of you together um, so that so you're, you're sort of that's that that will make you automatically because you have such good instincts automatically change the the attitude of, of the way you're playing so that's great good so um let that, that's so then just sort of thinking about this idea of of this partnership okay um and I must say, I have a sort of pet peeve about this, but so many times, and I felt this also when I was hearing you, that when you get to the sort of the, the tremolo stuff, okay, and there's all sorts of, you know, questions about what, it, what Brahms was trying to describe, and some people think it's the gypsy, the, the Hungarian uh, symbolum, you know, this, have you heard one? You can get it on you, YouTube, just look it up, symbolum, there's actually an amazing YouTube video of two symbolum players playing on, on a street somewhere in a city in Europe, and they're playing absolutely in sync, and, it's, and it's, so it's, it's hit with two two sticks, you know, two mallets. It looks a little bit like playing a marimba or something. It has that look, like the technique looks similar. And so you have this sort of tremolo kind of thing, you know, but they play melodically, you know, but they, yeah. So, so, th so you know, they think they're apparently, you know, when it, in Vienna at the time, there were many gypsy bands, two violins, one of these cymbalums, and probably a bass player or a clarinetist or something. Um, and so that, maybe Brahms had that in his ear. We don't know. But the main thing is that in this piece, when you're doing those tremolos, you're accompanying her, yeah. right? And I feel like you are sort of, when you're playing it, because I know it's hard, it's hard to get the timing and all of that, but I think it actually is easier if you relinquish a little bit of power and let, let the piano, let Dina lead the mel melodic line, because what happens is I feel like you're policing her part, and so then I lose, I, I don't know, she's actually playing the melody. So for example, a really great example of that is when you play, um, uh, Dina, where, okay, so wait, let's find it. Oh, yeah, so play, Dina, play 112. You have bar, bar numbers, yeah? Okay, so where's that? What, do we recognize that from somewhere? Yeah, 
somewhere else. Where else does that come from? Anyone in the studio audience want to answer that? Yay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. It's the first theme, right? Okay, yeah. So Brahms has put it in, he disguised it so well that you didn't know this, right? Okay, so, all right. So, but it's actually, yeah. So it's really important. And Brahms, like Beethoven, was brilliant at taking a motive and giving it different costumes, different disguises, yeah? And, and so, but it mustn't be so hidden that we don't even know it's there, okay? She has a theme. So let's try, can you try directly that place? Sorry, what bar was it again? Yeah, 112. Can you play it together? And, and so, you know, I actually think that it's actually easier. In fact, once maybe you could just play it without the tremolo. Just play, just play you know, play F and then double stops. Just, just the chords. Yeah, just the double stops. Yeah? I mean, I know the first one you can't, so just play it in F. And then, yeah, can you just do that for me? And just accompany Dina, okay? Color together. play a line okay don't worry about okay so all right they will be they might be out of tune right now because you haven't practiced them that way at the moment but just, don't worry about it just just play it play it play it as you're accompanying a melody like you're singing you're, you're singing her top line yeah <laughs> with that kind of sense of, of, of just supporting the melody. Okay, so one more right there. <laughs> it's tricky, yeah, yeah. That's your challenge to go home today after this and practice it and see if you can really shape it. I would actually stay with the double stops a little bit longer and really practice those and really inflect it the way you think the melody should be inflected mm -hmm. and then add the tremolo, okay. okay? Because it's so easy as a cellist to get caught up with, with this, you know? Um, one of the things you can think about is just making your, your, the, the change of bow quieter. Do you ever practice just the, just the end of the bow? So like, you know, you do... So you're, because you're, cause often we go, you know, so you change, just practice. Yeah, yeah. So you practice and then you maybe do, so. So you kind of disguise the bow change a little bit more. Good, yeah, yeah. And then of course now you have to change chord in addition to that, so making the left hand quiet. But, but so that you can really sense, make a sense of line through that. Okay, so that's something to think about. Um, good. Um, so now let's, so let's go back to the beginning um, and talk about things. I like, I like very much how you play it. I had one question about bar eight. Um, so, you know, what is it? And let, some of the, I don't think the additions are too different, but what, what are you looking at here? Um, okay, so um, you see that? Okay, I'm pointing out that there's a diminuendo at, at the end of bar eight. So, you know, could you just play that? Um, we'll just play the opening. And so, and the interesting thing is that while you're phrasing off at the end of bar eight, she's actually doing a crescendo. But I think that that is a good thing. I think that you're coming away and she's, the tension is going to her. So I don't, I don't think that the crossing is not something you should. So don't try to nail that last C. Okay. So if you can phrase it off. Um, actually, before we do that, can you play this down an octave for me? Just these, these two bars? Okay, now, did, did Brahms write, what, how did Brahms articulate that? Actually, all in one bow. Do it once more. Show it. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> okay, so I love that. I think that's beautiful. Now, so, so when you change your bow, you have to keep that shape. Yeah, now play it down an octave, but change bow this time. 
Exactly. You don't accent each bow change at all, right? Okay, so now on the right octave. Okay, that's it. That's the right gesture. <laughs> okay, do it one more time. Yeah, just do it once, just for practice again with just the bow. Just with, forget the left hand. No, 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 wait, wait, you know, you know, no left hand. Oh. Yeah, but on this, like, just do it with an open A string. But you're going to play louder than that, I think, with more, more weight. Yeah, to so really use the bridge to slow the bow down so you make the crescendo, right? That's not quite the shape that he's at. He's, it, the most is going to be on your down bow, right? On your last down bow? Yeah, you could even slow your bow down, maybe... Sorry, we have different A's, but... Sorry, Beautiful. Yeah, okay. So now let's try that. Let's try, try it together from the beginning. about the phrasing. That was beautiful, beautifully shaped now. Um, there's some interesting things, even more interesting things. Um, there's a piano after your first Dina, right? Like, right, piano, yeah? Um, <laughs> which we don't often hear. Um, I think you could do more of it, yeah? And Dina, so, um, I'm not sorry, not Dina, Yina, this is hard because we have this similar name, <laughs> rhyming names. <laughs> I have trouble with that kind of thing. Um, okay, so, now, so you are, you play in F major, she starts in F major, right? When you come in, la what happens to the harmony? Can you play, just play chords, and then right there, that's on your F, right? So you're no longer playing F major when you come in, right? So maybe it isn't triumphant. Maybe it's um, desperate. I don't know, maybe. I don't know, I'm just thinking about different words. But, but in other words, it's interesting, like if you really look at the harmony, it's like, she starts at F major and you start, but underneath you, the harmony changes. It's like, like the bottom's dropping out and something else is happening, it's adding. And then he adds this A flat, right? Which, which adds a minor kind of quality, a darker, a darker side to you. you know, so you're sort of, he, he's, he's playing with that, light, you know, light and darkness. He's playing with these, you know, already in the first bar, yeah? So, um, and then the other thing he's fooling around with is meter, right? Right, so you could be in three, four, but with your downbeat on the, F, on the F. And maybe if he had been writing 100 years later or even 75 years later, he might have written different meters for the different parts. I don't know, you have to ask yourself, does it mean that you should play as if you're playing your F on, as a, a first beat? Okay. I don't know, how, you, how do you think of it? those metric kind of things in, in Brahms. Do you, do you think of it as displacing the downbeat? Um, or are you I, thinking of yours? When I started, I yeah. do practice feeling, how do you say, the time uh, over. But then when, you, uh, when we started working tempo, I feel mm. more as a big uh, line. Mm -hmm. so as a big line, yeah. 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 yeah, no, it certainly is a big line. I'm, I'm talking on a more on a micro level. Like okay. Whether you feel, la da ba da buddy that, 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 that's, that that's the downbeat for you. Her downbeat's in a different place. She's going one, two, three, one, two. She's playing that rhythm. But it's, it's just, it's an interesting element in this. It's a, fun, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, you know, it, add, it just adds spice to it that you guys are kind of fighting over where the downbeat is in a way, you know? Um, and then again, and then, and then he's kind of fooling around. Um, so when he has a, that's like almost a longer, you know, so in a way you can just kind of take away the bar lines. The bar lines are kind of almost 
in a way meaningless, although there, there's a tension against it. But, but so it's, it's an interesting kind of metric things going on here. Um, but then I wanted to call your attention to something. There is a diminuendo in the piano part in the fourth bar. Did you know that? When you play la di No, it's kind of cool, isn't it? That maybe means that you also are, should come away, possibly. Yeah? Um, and so it gives you room to start at five, yeah? Um, and I really believe that Brahms really knew how to write fortissimo. He did. And, and like, there's really a great example like in the C minor piano trio. Have you played that? Do you know that he waits to write fortissimo until the, like, the end of the movement, until the, 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 where, where, where he comes back with the theme? So he, I, for me, that's an indication that he really uses his dynamics very specifically and really with true knowledge of what he's doing. He could easily have started this fortissimo, but he chose not to. So I think you know we're used to as cellists thinking of this as like oh yeah it's inspired some people say oh it's inspired by the third symphony and you know and we try to think and we oh this is our orchestral piece this is different from the E minor sonata it's open yes all this is true but it's also true that he didn't write a fortissimo here okay so so just just keep that in mind when you're when you're starting I think for both of you okay so let's okay so enough talking start again. <laughs> It really sounds great. The the bar seventeen when you start your your arpeggio, um, right? What's the just just could you once play show us show us um, what the the Brahms wrote in terms of slurring for you? Okay, just just show 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 us play it play it once. And then, no, did he write? Wait wait wait, Ina, did he write that? No, do his original Boeing. That's what I mean. Good. And you know, sometimes, like what I've done with these pieces, practice it actually quite a bit faster because it's easier to feel the bowing that way. Can you just play it fat, like just out of tempo, but so that the bowing feels easier? That bowing feels easier. That's a little awkward. Okay, so my argument is just that when you change your Boeing, and you're not changing too many Boeings, but make sure that when you change the Boeing, it doesn't change the shape of the phrase. Because I think Brahms is very explicit about how he wants you to, sh to shape this phrase and where he wants to put the stresses. And so make sure that whatever, it doesn't matter that you open the Boeing, that's fine, and of course not more natural in many ways. But, but see if you can preserve this shape that he's indicating by his slurs. Okay, so try, try one more time. With, can we try with Dina? Can we write there at 17? <laughs> You know, have you thought about here, um, that was beautiful, by the way, um, it, right here in 20 and 21, where you have, right, so he's writing a sort of hemiola in there, right, but he's not slurring it that way, right, he slurs opposite to the hemiola, he breaks up the hemiola, melodically it's a hemiola, but slurring wise it's different, so have you, what do you, how do you reconcile that, what do you, do you, do you, do you want to emphasize the fact that the Boeing, that he changes the Boeing and maybe emphasize the D a little bit more? Or do you want to kind of emphasize the, the hemiola within your Boeing? Okay, let's hear you do that. Can you, can you play from, just do it, do it um, wherever's comfortable for you to start right before that. Same place, okay. <laughs> One option, yeah. 
yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And then what if you kind of resist the hemiola a little bit? So we hear it, but it's more subtle, and you just you keep playing in three. Yeah? So that the D is going to be a little more expressive, right, in bar, in bar 21. Okay, and you know, all of this is very unsubtle because we're exaggerating both ways, you know. So you'll find, but I think there's, I think what's amazing about this piece is there are all these sort of strangely elusive moments. So you can, as an interpreter, you can choose to either go with one or the other of the elements. You say, I'm really going to show this email or not. But it, it's that, that, that kind of, that makes it interesting to be, you know, as an interpreter to kind of find your way with it. Um, but when you practice, do you practice phrasing in different ways like this? Uh, not always. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's a very interesting thing to do at, when you're, when you're in your practice because you're, you, you play so beautifully and, and I think that you could just expand your your artistic sort of vision of, of how something goes, if you, if you really try many different ways, different bowings, you know, like, you know, start it backwards, start a down bow once and see, see what that teaches you about, about how the phrase goes, you know, and, and what you want to bring out so that you're not, that the physical approach to the cello is not dictating, you know, the shapes that you want to make, okay? So the only way you can really work on that is to, is to really sh break it up and do a lot of different bowings for one passage. Also, that goes for fingerings, too, to kind of fool around with fingerings. One, just one detail I just want to mention. Be careful. I mean, this single note that he has is difficult, right? So make sure you just taper it a little bit more. He has a diminuendo right before it, right? So make sure you don't hit it, knock the D out a little bit too much. Okay, let's go on for now. So um, actually, we just go from 22 one more time. I mean, just going on the next part, yeah? It's a little weird to start there, but. Where by yam ti tarim this the way you're playing that um, the key would indicate something very kind of open right and then when you get to it's more searching right so I wonder if again here you could feel more just more open instead of intense yeah so so you're you're finding a way to be just generous yeah um, I think generosity as a performer that means to like sort of be um, willing to just let go of that intensity and just share just this openness, this key, okay? Um, then um, another just thing also might be interesting for others to notice is that, that the forte that he writes, um, so he has a forte here, beam, right? And do you know that in the recap he puts it in a different place, that forte? And I don't know if it's a mistake or if he meant it to be different. So he puts it, he puts it, where does he put it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, there, he puts it there. So I don't know, it's, again, this is an interpretive question. Um, you could say, I mean, I think Brahms was pretty, pretty fastidious, so maybe he meant it to be different. And he also, I think he, I mean, if you read some of the letters, I mean, he, he didn't want it, he didn't want, for example, he didn't want to write metronome markings in music. He said, oh yeah, that'll be fine for the first bar. Said, you know, so, so maybe he wanted to be different. I think probably that's the case, you know? So, so, but, but you have to know where it is the first time and the second time and show us, yeah? So make sure you make that clear. Um, okay, so play just by yourself the second theme. Okay, so can we talk about accents? Sure. So, um, 
an accent, it could be, it could be full of pathos, which is like kind of how you're playing it. Or it could be open, yeah, it could be sort of a, a more open kind of quality. Can you, can you, can you give me a more, yeah, sort of more, yeah, so it has, yeah, and it has to do with, of course, I was talking to Talia earlier about this, it has to do with whether your vibrato starts right away or, or if it, it's more of that kind of feeling, right? So it's the whole approach to the, to the note that, that's effect, that, that. Yeah. Yeah, and you can play with that, you know, do you want more pathos? Or so play with a... Okay, good. And what if um, maybe now... Can you play it actually without the chord? Yeah, it's slurred, isn't it originally? It would be nice to start it off, but wouldn't it? Try that once. Yeah, yeah, but one, one. That's it. Good. And now add the now add the chord. And now change your sound. Good. Okay. Good. Let's try that now with Dina. Yeah. Right there. Now we, we've worked on this a little bit. We got, we've gotten probably the tempo's getting a little bit stretched out. So what, it's, it's, what is the tempo marking at the beginning of the piece? Uh, I don't have any. Oh, Allegro Vivace. Allegro Vivace, which I think is actually pretty lively. Li vivace means lively, yeah. Um, it's, it's tempting, I think, sometimes because it's such a big piece and we want to make a big sound and all that, to get it, to get it sort of heavy. My, I, my take on it is that, is that actually um, going for the Allegro Vivace, it, a, fa a slightly faster and less sort of pedantic kind of approach is, is, is fresh in this piece <laughs> um, and, and helps you, you know, sort of get through it. Because a place like this, you know, if you... If you're too, if you're too insistent about your eighth notes, she's going ya da di di da da di da. She says something very moving, um, and yes, there's there's fight between the triplets and the eighth notes, but I think there's also a bigger line here, okay? And then when we get ya da di da di da 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 ya da 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 da, right? So that has vivace quality, okay? So go from here. Would you agree with me that the meter is displaced? Yeah. So in a way, if you, and actually, I think in this place, it's actually really easier for, as, as a cellist, to actually displace it. So if you feel like you're playing, yeah, play it once as if those are downbeats. OK, can we try? So Dina, can you play from uh, 50? I mean, that, that's one way of doing it. And, and maybe some people would argue, and maybe I felt a little bit like I lost the tension of, tea, of the tie over. So, you know, it, again, I'm just throwing these ideas out at you as things to think about, you know, just to sort of play with a little bit. Um, again, just as Brahms set up in the beginning, he had like you in three and then a sort of five. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So one, two, three, four, or, or sort of a longer, a longer thing, yeah? Um, it's the same here. It's the same. It, it works the same way here. So you have you have this now a long line. So if you could feel that, if Brahms had lived in another century, he probably would have just taken out those bar lines after the after the high C, maybe. Yeah. 
So you can kind of think about that too, okay? So let's, can we do it one more time now? Try with feeling the downbeats, but also feeling the ties at the same time, yeah? you do very beautiful things in this and it sounds really like you're exploring and I think that's great I think that's beautiful um, but one thing I miss a little bit is that from 74 when you when Dina starts da -da 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 -da, and you yeah from that point all the way to this place um, is one kind of big section in a way yeah and from my test, maybe you do like a big retard in the middle, like around 84, I think it was. Yeah. You know, it's maybe just a matter of proportion because I like the fact that you're flexible. Mm -hmm. But if you could just, in, also, somewhere in your mind, think of this whole section leading you to the, the tremolando thing. Yeah. yeah? So that so you keep it together a little bit because it gets a little bit bent out of shape, in my, in my opinion, in terms of the bigger structure. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, so just, just, just that. Um, you know, yes, uh, I love this, that you're bringing out those duples, but maybe it doesn't have to affect the tempo that it's, a, like, we lose the sense that it's a Allegro Vivace anymore, yeah? So that's just a thought, you know? Um, good, and then we have to stop. Okay, two minutes. Okay, and then, and then one last thing, Dina, uh, uh, sorry, Yina. <laughs> sorry, it's getting late. At 90, at 91, um, it's tricky because the piano has a sforzando on the downbeat. You do not, but you do have one in the next bar. So just make sure you don't give away too much and save it for that. Okay. Yeah, so you don't land too much. Yeah. Okay. Can we try that one more time? That little that section um, uh, from seventy four. Just feeling it as one thought. <laughs> Yeah, so like use Dina's part a little bit more. She has 60 thoughts the whole time, right? So just let yourself be carried by those as well. The, the crescendo does not start as quite as early as you think. And actually, she has it first. And so if you let it come from her, and then you, you answer her. And then, see, for my taste, if you're going to, you, which you are, it's lovely, you're sort of on the back side of the tempo, let it then go towards the swatsando. Let, let it release into the, into the swatsando, yeah? Could you do from maybe, uh, where's a good place? Maybe from, how about the upbeat to 82? So after your, yeah? Maybe 
actually just really going to that and not doing a big retard before it. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's always this question, okay, so Brahms, maybe he was really flexible when he played these pieces, but, but also he knew how to write a retard if he wanted one, and he knew how to, you know, so, so just, you know, it's always that balance of how much are you going to read the score literally, and, and how much you're going to, you know, use your own instinct and your own imagination, which is wonderful, but it's always a balance, you know. Um, but ex keep exploring, you know, so in your practice, try lots of different things. So in your rehearsal, try different timings, you know, and, and ma make them both successful, make both of them work, you know. So I think that's the direction you need to go, because you play so beautifully, and just keep experimenting with, with what you're doing musically. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs>